This is Dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. Tonight, Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel. And sitting in for Gloria Barron, I'm Phil Kogan. May, on the first show that you did here, you discussed the motives for getting involved in this research. Okay, once you've, you've decided that something has to be done, that this research has to be done, just how do you go about doing it? Well, it's a big job. First, you have to have the feeling that something is wrong, like you say, you see it. And then you begin at just, we talked about collecting newspapers until the Warren Report came out because the columnists were listing very main discrepancies in the physical evidence. And in September 1964, the Warren Report was published, and I bought it, and I began to read it. And I'll show you how I got into the Warren Report, but after I had been well into my research, in February 1968, the minutes of the Warren Commission became, some of them became declassified. We're talking about declassification in Washington now, national security. The working minutes of the meeting, of the Warren Commission, some of them have been published. And there was a meeting of the commission members April 30th and they had a discussion on what to do with the material they had. They were going to put out a book which would be out in September. This is the end of April. They had May, June, July, and August, four months, and then the material would be bound and sold. And they had many, many problems they had never even scratched yet, and we'll go into those. But at the meeting of the Warren Commission, April 30th, Earl Warren, chairman, had to decide what to do. He said, naturally, we're going to publish a book. That was the intention, to get a book out and tell everybody what's going on. But what about the appendixes? What about all these reports, such as the FBI reports, State Department reports, and witness testimony? What do we do with all this? Are we obligated to give it out to the public? And one member of the commission said that if we didn't, that there would be feeling that there was a deep conspiracy. Uh, John J. McCloy, I'm reading from the minutes of the meeting now, said there would be a feeling if we suppressed it that the conspiracy was in the land. So the opinion was that we would take this material and publish it. Alan Dulles said the following. He said we would have two volumes, the report, meaning the Warren Report, and a volume of appendices, which ran into 26 volumes. We'll make this available so that nobody can say you have not tried to make the whole thing secret. And if historians later want to read it over and work on it, well and good. But I don't think anybody would pay any attention to it to begin with. Well, here I am, May Brussel, and I did pay attention to it. And that's how they were talking about me and us and people who care. They underrated the determination of a handful of people to take this material and see if what they published matched what they said. And I was well into my research when this was declassified, but that was the opinion of Alan Dulles that nobody cares anyway. And in these times where you're talking about life and death and doomsday bombs and power structures, there have to be people who do care. It doesn't take very many, Phil, to change the course, but it takes a few. So Alan Dulles didn't know me, and I was around, and I did. I was doing my work well into it by then. So you actually started with the uh, Warren Commission report. Well, I started with the Warren Commission report, yes. Now, getting back before we opened the Warren report, and I brought it with me today, I'd love to carry it around. At that same meeting on April 30th, the commission was meeting, and they had had about 12 meetings that have been published now in one particular book. And... Earl Warren says, I have a matter that I want to discuss with you because there are rumors and articles such as Buchanan. That was Thomas Buchanan who wrote the book, Who Killed Kennedy? Now, this is in April, and they're working on a report. He says, Buchanan and Lane, meaning Mark Lane. He doesn't use his first name. He says, Buchanan and Lane 
there's some things written that may be a good thing if we go into. He said, we will ask, this is Chairman Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, we will ask the president of the Associated Press and the president of the United Press International and tell them that we would like to have them examine their reports and files on the assassination and confer with their people who are familiar with it and then assign one of their top people who could come down here to see us and discuss on a confidential basis, not for publication, anything that may be on their minds to be investigated. So the news media, which was already controlled, was to send, you can imagine how objective a reporter would be going to Earl Warren if the president of the Associated Press sent him down there. Now, Earl Warren said this, I think by doing this, we'll establish to them that we investigated everything they have on their minds. Now, the problem was, what was on Buchanan's mind? What was on Mark Lane's mind? What evidence did they have? They walked the streets. He walked the streets in Dallas. He met these people and talked with them, Mark Lane, all over the Knoll and Grassy Knoll and everywhere. Why would the United Press satisfy what was on their mind? Now, this is the way problems are handled in the United States today. You have problems. You have real problems in this country. And we talked about father figures on the first show. Until you realize, and I'm going to read you what Louis Neiser wrote, a famous lawyer in the United States, one of the most famous lawyers. I'm going to read you his introduction to the Warren Report. And when you see these men who have written books, who are the figures that everybody looks up to, when you see in their own words how they work, you will understand why you have problems today. Well, the solution was, uh, Earl Warren went on, if there are any areas unexplored, we will explore them. I mentioned before that Senator Cooper was conscientious. He let out a few little squeaks. He did bring up problems. So then he went on and brought up an area he thought should the same meeting of April 30th. He said, I think that our investigation is weak. Now, they're four months from publishing. He said, what happened to this man, meaning Oswald, when he left the United States and went to Russia and came back? I think we ought to get him in the record and see... Uh, what the State Department knows about him. What about DeMorenschild, Senator Cooper asked, meaning George DeMorenschild. Well, at that point, Earl Warren said, we'll go off the record. And the commission, the secretary stopped and everything went off the record. Then the commission, Earl Warren answered about George DeMorenschild and said, he has a full deposition. We'll go off the record. They discussed something. Chairman said, back on the record, and Mr. Rank and the attorney went on to the change of subject about declassifying some of the transcripts. Now, they went off the record about DeMorenschild, and Senator Cooper was asking a question. When the Warren Report was established, when the Warren Commission was appointed, in the beginning of the book, you will read a section that says that members of the commission should be present at the hearing of the witnesses. And I charted out which members of the commission attended any of the hearings of the witnesses. And there were only about four witnesses out of 552 that any member of the commission attended. George DeMorenschild was in Washington and gave his testimony seven days before this meeting. His testimony is dated April 22nd. And this meeting was April 30th. And Earl Warren didn't say, oh, Mr. Jenner, DeMorenschild was here last week. Now, George DeMorenschild was the most important witness out of 552 witnesses called in Washington, and I'm going to tell you why. He gave the longest testimony of any witness in the Warren Report. He gave 119 pages. His wife gave 45 pages. It was the most important witness. And a member of the commission, had he been notified that DeMorenschild was there, wouldn't have asked, what about DeMorenschild? And he should have been there. Now, who was present when the most important witness of the Warren Report testified? Albert Jenner, the attorney for the commission, because somebody had to ask him questions. The Warren Shell didn't do a dialogue, you see. And the other person present in that room was Alfred Goldberg, the historian from the Pentagon. Now, we're talking about police states and warfare states, Phil. And we're talking about intelligence governments and covert governments. And I could read you, not to digress, in the meeting of the commission, who's going to write the Warren Report? 
and Earl Warren says, let's have Mr. Winnaker come down and write it, and he is going to send two historians. Well, I have a very beautiful book that came out of East Germany and caused a big stir and was not on the book stands in America called Who's Who in the CIA. I have it here so you can see it, Phil. It's a beautiful little book. And Mr. Winnaker of the CIA was the man who sent the authors of the Warren Report. Now, I have a whole file of people connected. Here's Dr. Rudolf Winnaker, born in Germany, lecturer in history, analyst in the OSS, which became our CIA, 1945 to 1949, historian in the War Department, 1949 to 1965, chief of the historical division of the Pentagon. Now, we have Harvard, we have Yale, we have uh, Eastern schools, that Princeton, we have historians in America. And who is writing American history? This happened in Nazi Germany, it happens in Greece. I, when I say Nazi or CIA, I'm not talking out of my head. And Mr. Winnaker, according to Earl Warren, was to send Mr. Goldberg. And Mr. Goldberg, George de Morenschild's name was George von Morenschild. And he stood up at the Petroleum Club in Dallas. He's a man who has worked for our government. We could talk for hours about de Morenschild, who defended Himmler. He was, at, he was apprehended by the FBI, followed from New York to Corpus Christi during the last war for drawing what they thought were installations, that he was a Nazi spy. He was the only friend, or supposedly the sole friend, of Lee Harvey Oswald in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, his longest friend and buddy. He came before only Mr. Jenner and Mr. Goldberg from the Pentagon. And a member of the commission is saying, well, what about the Warren Shield? And Earl Warren goes off the record, and that is the end. Now, do Would it be possible for people who don't know what testimony he gave to um, briefly explain some of the things he said on the record when well, he was interviewed? I would love to. I'll spend one whole day. I make notes because I think we could talk an hour a day on these things because people, these are the things, uh, when I make my broad statements about what's happening in the nation, I follow every document and every word, and I'm taking it from their mouth. And we'll go to DeMore and Schilt. Now, back to the research. When I started my research, I received the Warren Report. I have a copy here today to show you, Phil. And I said, um, oh, incidentally, there are four copies of the Warren Report. There are four copies. Before we get right to the Warren Report, maybe we should discuss those again. If you go to the government printing office and you order your copy of the Warren Report, hardbound, there is no introduction at all. It says nothing. And if you buy a paperback edition put out by Popular Library for 75 cents, Robert Donovan writes a five-page introduction in which he lines up Lee Harvey Oswald as an obscure midfit, misfit, a loner, fanatic, crank, mentally deranged. And he says, people of this type, he deluded the men who commit these historic crimes. Now, November 23, 1963, in the Los Angeles Herald and Examiner, was a description exactly of the words that Robert Donovan was to use when the Warren Commission was finished. And if somebody in Los Angeles knew that on November 23rd, 1963, why did you bother to have a Warren Commission at all? The cover story was out. The words of the introduction of the Warren Report, after all that research, were identical to the November 23rd Herald Examiner article, which I compare my early work to who was saying these images. Now, the third edition of the Warren Report was put out by New York Times. And that's a dollar, the paperback, so that everyone in the nation could have it. And there's an introduction in that one by Harrison Salisbury. You see, three Warren reports had different introductions attacking different kinds of approaches. And one, the government printing office wouldn't dare to put it in at all because they couldn't stand by it at all. But Harrison Salisbury, who's making all the yelling about the country in Greece or the secrecy in the government, the Pentagon, uh, when the New York Times things came out. They're not baby cling. They're involved up to their necks. And what Harrison Salisbury put in his introduction, he was managing editor of the New York Times. His concern was for the time that was spent, my interest in him was in creating the motive. But in his putting down the Warren people or the researchers, he did a report that anybody who went into this material with other than an approval of the Warren Report was un-American and unloyal to their country. 
he put a very negative thing that you have to be mentally deranged to challenge this material that it is absolutely accurate and the only kind of person who would challenge this material would have to be um, out of their minds. He says they would be, these are his words, Mr. Salisbury, when the Warren Report came out, the day it came out, in his, the New York Times edition, said that anybody who, who investigates or goes into these theories frequently are self-serving. They're designed to advance special political goal. Some have the objective of, uh, of undermining the United States and its government structure. Some are aimed at owing distrust and confusion at home. All this report can do is to provide a hard rock basis of fact. There is a tendency of dangerous implications to the American system, he's saying, to challenge what you're going to read. The theories are the most part not founded on actual evidence, but contradictions, confusions, and omissions cited between the witnesses. There are always men and forces, skilled and able, that are hampered neither by scruple nor principle, who convert the national mood to selfish and particular ends. He's putting us in a bag that everything here is answered. No material question remains unsolved so far as the death of President Kennedy is concerned. Now, that was pretty presumptuous. The book was out. It was time for the historians to read it and the people that were involved and the people who knew. But in case you had any doubt, the New York Times said that day that no material question remains unsolved. He didn't say, well, here it is, read for yourself. He said nothing remains unsolved. Now, the important introduction to the volume that I received, the, the first one that I received, the Warren Report, printed by Doubleday, hardbound, had an analysis and commentary by Louis Neiser, who is a famous attorney in the United States, and we talked about it before. And he goes into the, the whole introduction, is to say that this assassination is different than all others because the motive, he said, is not founded. These are his words. Uh, the most persuasive analysis that, analysis that Oswald was frustrated, bitter, neurotic, acted alone, is not founded in the or, extraordinary factual tracing of his conduct, not in the facts, but in the psychiatric study of his personality. Now, I've read those 10 million words over and over and over again in the 26 volumes. There was no psychiatric evidence of this at all to match what he's saying. It reveals his, I'm continuing, Louis Nice says, it reveals Oswald's emotional disorganization. He served in the Marines three years, got an honorable discharge. He had the mental capacity of an officer, according to uh, his, the officer over Mr. Donovan. He had his electronic, he had training in all kinds of things, no mental breakdown, no hospitalization, no indication in the service. And when he got his honorable discharge, he re-enlisted, and they didn't say, I mean, what exists, in fact, Phil, are the medical records of his service. There was no evidence of mental disarrangement at all. The State Department had no trouble with him in Russia. They had no trouble getting him back. He was not. See, Louis Neiser's telling he's emotionally disorganized. Nothing, Yet there's nothing to support Nothing that. to support. Oswald's violence derived from an inner torment, from devils of inadequacy and rejection. There was nothing to support that. I, he was riding back and forth to friends in the Soviet Union. He worked in a radio factory. He had friends there. He had friends. The people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area testified that he rejected them. Not that they rejected him. They kept calling him, and he rejected them. There was, and the people he worked with, they, no one had a negative. Um, nothing supported that. Neither goes on. It was because he could not make associations, even with Russians and Cubans, it was because he was spurned by all that he took revenge on authority by an act of private retaliation. Now, Oswald had tried to get into Cuba, or supposedly did, want a visa when he was in Mexico. But Castro knew he was an agent of the CIA. He said it right away. He, didn't, he knew Oswald had been in the Soviet Union, and his people in New Orleans and Texas knew that Oswald lived in a house with everybody who had security clearances, who were oil people, wealthy people uh, working with the FBI and our government. Why would Castro want Oswald, when we had made so many attempts to assassinate him, why would they want Oswald in Cuba, even if he wanted to go there? He was rejected, not because he had a foul personality, but because Castro wanted to live. 
you know, it, so then Louis Neiser goes on. He beat his wife. I'm going to read what he said, and then we're going to open the Warren report. But I, what I want to show you is how a famous lawyer, one of the most famous lawyers in the United States, can be used and brainwash you. Cause, Phil, you know, this is the news media, and we're going to untangle the knot that we're used. We're not going to brainwash you to believe me, but I want you to see how he could be used to tell you things that not one sentence matches the evidence that I went into. He, these are his adjectives. I'll describe them in the introduction. He beat his wife. He had each one of these is a lie. I have a whole book on Oswald's marriage, and I'll show you how the research works. Nyer says, Nyer says he beat his wife. He had a dishonorable discharge. Now, now this for a fact, this, dishonorable discharge this is, no, all, is not supported by... No, all that I'm saying is what Louis Nyser says in the right. introduction to the Warren Report, and not one sentence, not one sentence is backed in fact. And Neiser's uh, introduction and said, is in, the, in what edition? Uh, in the Double Day ish, edition, hardbound. And I spent seven years going to the origin of which witnesses said these things. And I'll show you how my cross-filing system works. How they met Oswald. I have a book on their background. How they met, how many times they saw him, how many times they saw him with his wife. People who were saying he beat his wife were at a particular party in December 62, who heard it from another couple, who heard it from another couple. And that Based couple on rumor. never saw And when you go round and round and round, the original source never saw it. Okay. Never uh, saw uh, the the so reason I point to dishonorable it, discharge is because that is a concrete fact, which that, he should, had an you, honor, could, yeah, that he, you could check back absolutely. to the original source. That's right. And if you find that Mr. Neiser says that he had a dishonorable discharge, and if you go back to the official military records and you find that it was an honorable discharge, that's right then it leads you to question other facts. Ab absolutely, because the hard facts, that's what you work with. When you have two witnesses saying something, and I'll show you how it works, and it's really beautiful. When you have two witnesses saying something, and you don't know who to believe, then I would go back to the volume and show the difference. Like when Marina Oswald was called as a witness before the commission, and she's the very first witness, on page six, she hasn't gotten very long into the thing, and Earl Warren says, sit down and relax, and we'll, don't be nervous, and we'll talk. And the commission lawyer says, when did Lee Oswald, when did your husband lose his job in Fort Worth? Now, I file that under job. I file that under Marina against Lee, and I file that under commission slanted. Because I, as I did my research, see, I had to read it over. I just read it as a book the first two times. As I read it over, I find that in the exhibits, Lee Oswald has a very intelligent letter of resignation to Raleigh Coffee Company where he was working. And he says, I have moved from the Fort Worth area to Dallas. I have more money, but I appreciate the job. He left there on a Friday in October and didn't say he was leaving. And they, he said, would you please mail my check up to Dallas? And so the man who had hired him at Riley testified and said he was one of the best people we had. We liked him very much. We were sorry to lose him. So there's a photograph of an intelligent letter of resignation, which when I read it meant that he was not fired. So the image of like Louis Neiser goes on to say he was disillusioned because he couldn't hold a job. And there's a letter of resignation. Now he goes on to the Fort Worth area, from Fort Worth to Dallas, and proceeds with another job. When Marina Oswald wants the image with the commission that her husband was this ne'er-do-well that Louis Nye is going to pick up, they say, how long was he without a job? And she says, oh, it, it was like uh, two weeks. That he, and I had to live with friends. It was over two weeks that he didn't have employment. Well, this is Marina's testimony. He didn't have an employment, and friends had to help him get a position in Dallas because he couldn't do it on his own. After she testified, Marguerite Oswald testified, and she's the mother. And she said, tell us about Lee, and they went into different subjects. And she said, I was at his home one evening in October on Friday, and Lee came home, and these people who came from nowhere so fast and pounced on them and took over their lives said, we have a job for you in Dallas. Well, the job was at Jagger's Chili Stovall, where he stayed for six months. You would need security clearances in many departments. They published government bonds. They do photographic work and do maps for the United States Army. And these people are saying, Lee, you're moving to Dallas. Wednesday, he went to the 
uh, employment agency because as an agent, when you move, there has to be an overt thing that you go and apply. But the message was there from Mr. Meller and Bowie sent him to Jaggers where he went. And he began that Thursday. He was on the payroll. Now, in the back of my 26 files are the canceled checks of Lee Oswald with a steady employment, a letter of resignation, a consistent job pattern. So if the image by his wife, see, I don't know who to believe, the mother or the wife, but the wife can't be telling the truth that he couldn't have a job for weeks, that he was a ne'er-do-well, because the canceled checks show that he did. See, this is the way, it, I, I hope all of you are following this. It isn't complicated. I'm trying to say it slowly. But this is the way my mind was working on approaching the subject. Because, now, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to sidetrack no, no. you. When you were talking about Mr. Neiser's introduction oh. and uh, mentioning that he made several statements in the introduction, which when uh, they're closely examined, turn out to be false. Every, it, oh, you, yeah. you, I interrupted you when you were yeah. discussing the dishonorable discharge. I'll show discharge. you. I took his introduction in the margin of my book, which is marked over and over again. I have lie, 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 because when the research was done, he had these gross lies. All right, he said, Oswald, here is, he abused his Russian wife. He severed relations with his mother. He was unable to hold any job for more than a short period. His marriage was disrupted by frequent separations long quarrels, long periods of sexual impotence, unable to provide simple comforts for the family. He rejected capitalism and communism and couldn't live in the USA or Russia. In April 63, he shot and missed Major General Edwin Walker. He had the conviction in his mind that murder of a famous man would at last make the world not take note of him. He had a hunger for acceptance. Now, Louis Neither said he wanted acceptance as a martyr. Lee Oswald was arrested and said, I didn't kill anybody, I'm innocent. Then he yelled, I'm a patsy. That's a, he, he began his introduction to the Warren Report like, by saying this is the most unusual kind of murder because this is the only political assassin that never said, I did it. And a martyr would say, I did it. And then he contradicts himself four pages later and say, Oswald wanted to be a martyr. If Oswald says, I'm a patsy, which is one of the few recorded words of his life in that jail because the police interviews were thrown away, that's a hard way to be a martyr if you're a patsy. Well, he went on and said, when circumstances, partly accidental, gave him the opportunity, he was ready to go in. Louis Neiser says his inner corruption had removed any decency or conscience. He could have shot at anybody. Now, he's getting into a hypothetical. He's way off on the evidence, and he's really blowing your brain now when he says his inner corruption removed any sense of decency for a famous lawyer, a trial lawyer in the United States to speak of any human being in those terms to say that all of this is removed. He says he could have shot at Khrushchev or de Gaulle or Mao Zedong or a popular sports hero. He's getting into the American kind of image again. He was determined to protest against the world which he thought had shut him out. And part of the loner's pattern is heroism. Then he goes in that, that the hero even wants to deny what he's doing. Uh, Louis Neiser ends his introduction with this. If we approach the question from the viewpoint that Oswald had declared war against society because it rejected him as unfit, then the mystery is no more. But if May Brussel accepts the question that Oswald did not declare war and that these are all lies that Louis Neiser said, then the mystery still exists, Phil. Because of all of his reasons for killing don't exist then our mystery still does exist. And Louis Neither has said, if everything I say is true, there is no more mystery. And I'm saying, if nothing you say is true, that's where I begin. And that was the introduction to my Warren Report. And we'll tell people that they're listening to Dialogue Assassination on KLRB Carmel. Okay. When... So that we don't jump all around and we tie it together now, I explained how Alan, Alan always thought that nobody would read this material anyway. And that I did receive the Warren Report, and I read it, and I had to wait from September 64 until December 64 for the 26 volumes to arrive from the government printing office, but I was busy reading the Warren Report at that time. And the area that caught my fascination, it's interesting because a lot of people are working on the bullet trajectory, the distances, the ballistics, like they're working on the ballistics in Los Angeles, the Sirhan case, and I work as Sirhan, the agent, not the ballistics. I'm in that area because of Oswald. So, 
my mind as a person, and I didn't know anyone else in the country who was doing this or who would be doing it, was Oswald the person, the, the man who had been arrested because he had traveled a lot and seemed to have a lot of money and passports and been to Russia and back in Mexico and New Orleans and had applied for a new passport in April 63. So I was interested in the movements of Oswald the person. Now, just by coincidence, we read the remark where Senator Cooper, four months before the book was published, said, I think where our investigation is weak is what happened. We read this before. To this man, when he left the U.S., went to Russia, came back, and the whole State Department thing and the DeMoran shelves. Well, I opened up the Warren report. I read the whole thing, but I really ran right away to finances because wherever you do have conspiracies or people moving, there's always money or bread involved in it in some way. So before I even read about the motorcade or the part that preceded in the Warren report, I opened up to, in, in my Doubleday edition, to page 280, which began the associations in the Dallas-Fort Worth community. Louis Neiser had said, also in his introduction, that there could not have been a conspiracy. He ruled out in his introduction, in case you didn't read the whole book, there couldn't be a conspiracy because if Oswald were a Russian agent, he wouldn't bring home a Russian wife in a milieu that was unpopular to her and so obvious in the Dallas-Fort Worth community. And he couldn't be an American agent because um, we asked the heads of our agencies if he was, J. Edgar Hoover, Richard Helms, they didn't examine the material. They said, was he an agent? And they said there was no iota of truth. He was not an agent. So it was their word versus the evidence that piled up. So I opened my book to the associations in the Dallas-Fort Worth community. And this is the way it reads. The Russian-speaking community. Shortly after his return from Russia in 1962, Oswald and his family settled in Fort Worth, Texas, where they met a group of Russian-born and Russian-speaking people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The members of this community were attracted to each other by common background, language, and culture. Now, Oswald had been in the Marines three years. He'd gone to the Soviet Union and said, I don't like America. They're hard on the blacks. My mom can't get a job. I'm going to give you my radar information. I can't stand America. And he stays there several years and comes home with a Russian wife. I shouldn't think he'd be in the newspaper, said Oswald is returning, the expatriate, the guy who doesn't like America is returning. It was in all the newspapers. And the source of introduction of people to Oswald was in the newspaper, and the espionage system, the covert activity, they have to have an excuse to see him. So two prominent people of the Russian community, when they were called to testify, said, I read in the paper they were home. Why would these oil people, these engineers, want to call on them? You see, what would they have calling on them? Now, if they have something in common, they don't have anything in common with Lee and Marina Oswald, if they're what we're going to think they are. They have something in common with them if they're playing another role, but why do they want to see them? Their excuse was that she came from the same town that I was in. Well, I don't see people mixing the boundaries like an anti-Castro Cuban being with a pro-Castro because they came from the same town on the same fishing village. They just don't wrap with each other at all. So the war report says these people in that area that were their friends had this common background. It says several were connected with oil explanation, production, and processing industry that flourishes in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, unquote. I have to digress. We talked about George de Morenschild, his testimony, his relation to the commission. He was one of the people in the oil exploration business. At the time of the assassination, he was in Haiti. He was the employee of Brown and Root. That is the firm that does all the building in Vietnam of the airways, the tiger cages now, the prison systems. He worked for Brown and Root. There was a talk show in San Francisco alleging how much money that Lady Bird Johnson had invested in Brown and Root. Ramparts did a whole study of Lyndon Johnson with the construction firm of Brown and Root, and they have places up and down the coast here in Palo Alto. They are the largest builders from this country in Vietnam of airstrips buildings, and George de Morinchild was the employee of Brown and Root. This is one of the people that Lee Oswald, his best friend, and Mrs. de Morinchild, we'll go back one minute, is the only link in 10 million words of Lee Oswald to a rifle. Nobody saw him hold a rifle. We'll go later, but I want to share it when they say they were in 
the oil exploration field and processing industry, they were in many things. And these were the people that they were to see, called the associations in the Dallas area. As described more fully in Chapter 7, many of these people assisted the Oswald in various ways. Some provided the Oswalds with gifts of such things as food, clothing, and baby furniture. You will read, it, they say in Chapter 7 and Appendix 13, that one day George Bowie called on Marina Oswald and gave her 100 dresses. I'm kidding you not, 100 dresses. It's right here in the book. They just say clothing right here and, ba and baby furniture. Some arranged appointments and transportation for medical and dental treatment and assumed the cost in some instances. And when Oswald undertook to look for employment in early October, and again, when marital difficulties arose between the Oswalds, uh, they, Marina and their child were housed in the homes of the various members of this group. The commission has examined the background of these individuals and thoroughly investigated their relation, Oswald's relationship with them, and there is no basis to suppose that Oswald came to Fort Worth upon his return from Russia for the purpose of establishing contacts with the Russian-speaking community in that area. It says that Oswald, upon his arrival, this is page 281 of the Warren Report, Double Day Edition, upon his arrival in 1962, Oswald did not know any members of the relatively small and loosely knit Russian-speaking community. Now, when I did my research, and I went into the Russian community, and Mr. Jenner of the commission says, we haven't gone into that area, and they had four more months, and it took me seven years. At the time of the assassination, the personal possessions of Lee and Marina Oswald were taken by the FBI, and inventories were made. And when Marina Oswald was called as a witness before the commission, what is this, what is that? When she was married to Lee Oswald in the Soviet Union, she went away for three weeks, to a resort, hotel, or a home, and she left him, and she had a little ad address book in the Soviet Union. And it was a standard FBI, just a copy of this address book that she brought from the Soviet Union. It was a package of letters and little documents and, and personal mail letters Lee had written to her in the hospital when they had the baby. And they were very innocent documents, and they opened them up. And among the address books, she testified, these are from the Soviet Union, I had them in the Soviet Union, was the name of a woman whose husband got Lee the job at Jagger's Chili Stovall. That name is in her book that she said was people in the Soviet Union. Now, Lee Oswald's diary, and not his diary, but his telephone book and the names that he saw, he has the name at the Hotel Berlin in Moscow of a woman who was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that they were to meet later. And these things the commission could never get into now before. They know why. I've cross felt every single name. And I could throw something even heavier than that. But this is what I'm talking about, Phil. Okay, when I took the Warren Report and I read this information about people housing them, people getting them clothes, people buying furniture, people uh, transporting them to New Orleans and back, I took my 26 volumes. This is the way I started. I read them all, you know, backwards and forwards. And then I took the 26 volumes and I took every single person in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that met them from the time they arrived, Robert and his mother and the people that called on Leah Marina. And there were 28 people that they, these 28 people were very important to the political assassination for this reason. The government needed a cover story and they needed a motive. And they created a fictitious motive. And I had to see, I didn't know where I was going, but I began my own cross-filing system, which I explained as a computer type of thing and is going in computers now, of who these 28 people were. And I began making dividers, three whole notebooks, and I bought one, and then I bought two, and I was filled, I bought three, and I bought divider sections. And sometimes when I'm at the drugstore buying, I like 20 or 30 dividers. People say, what is, pardon me, but what is that for? Like last week I bought 10 boxes of massive scotch tape and, a woman behind me said, uh, I don't mean to be inquisitive, what's that for? I said, well, I do research, you know. Okay, I, I compiled 28,000 typewritten pages, cross-filing the Russian community in the Fort Worth area, just that area, Phil. And this is the way the dividers line up, and this is what is going into the computers in Washington, and this is why they can't say now there's no new evidence, because we have the fact. I have a book called Background, 
and that background covers all the people. It says these people had a common interest, culture, and language, and I went into each witness as he's called. Your name is George Zamora and Shield. Yes, what do you do for employment? How did you come to this country? Uh, what did you do, you know, before you came here? And where, where they were born, how they came to the United States, or if they were born in the United States, where they came from, what job they always held and what job they held up to the time of the assassination goes into background. And I came through a pattern of an emigrate group that had one thing in common, and that was that they were all thrown out at the time of the Russian Revolution, you know, by Trotsky, they were displaced, the, the oil families, wealthy families, that moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But when another, when one woman is called to testify, a particular woman, they say, this is Voshinen, how did you happen to come to the Dallas-Fort Worth area? She said, well, we came over here and arrived in New Jersey, and there were too many of us, so they sent us to Houston, and from Houston, they go to the Greek Orthodox Church to Fort Worth. Or Dallas. Now, this is all new material, Phil. This is this is the subject on which I worked. They, there were too many of us, so they sent us. And then I began going into the intelligence system and the operation, like who is sending us and them. So background is how they came here, and that gets all the way into the intelligence operation of the United States. But you see, I have a book on background. Then I had a another section on how met, because the commission would say, was there an occasion where you met Lee and Marina Oswald. And the reason I had to compile three or four hundred pages on how I met was that people who were saying things about Lee Oswald that Louis Neiser was saying in the Warren Report had never met him or his wife in their lives. Or they had met Marina and they'd never met Lee. And it became overwhelming that Marina was feeding them information about her husband as a person that didn't back up the documents. And you had to say, why was she doing it? So I have a book, Marina Against Lee, or Marina Lies. Now, a member, a fellow researcher in Los Angeles who was in Washington just this summer, went into the National Archives, and for the, it was his first trip there. So while he was there, he got documents, microfilms, and copied papers for me because he knows my area of research. So declassified now are minutes of the working staff, the lawyers, not the Warren Commission, but the lawyers, and he is setting me up now and coughing in L.A. The minutes of the meeting with the lawyers say, what will we do with Marina? She's telling so many lies. Should we give her a polygraph test? See, I've finished my research on Marina. And when I do my book, I'll include what the lawyers knew about her. How can we handle her? Like, she says she's living with the halls because Lee doesn't have a job. And nobody will believe it because he has this job. What are we going to do with her? Well, my work, my research is done. So I have a book, How Met, because... In creating a thing and you're talking a person about a person saying some pretty heavy things, if you never met him, somebody is feeding you that information. Then I have a book, How Many Times Together, because people were saying that he beat his wife, he was not kind to her, and I wanted to know who was saying it and did they ever see them in a, any marital situation. Then I have Marina alone. Which witnesses were alone with Marina Oswald, where Lee was never present? Like George DeMore and Jilts, for his introduction to her is he comes down to her apartment, knocks on the door with a Colonel Orloff who says, I'm George DeMore and Jilts, and this is Colonel Orloff. And that's a heavy name. I, bl I could blow your minds with this information on Orloff. And why does he want to see Marina? Because she's a little Russian babushki from the same town. And I, we had so much in common because I used to, I passed through the village. Don't buy it. It's just not the why he was alone. Then, where I get discrepancies like times with Marina alone, they would call a witness like George Bowie, and the Warren Commission would say, Mr. Bowie, was there an occasion where you met Lee and Marina Oswald? He says, yes, I was at a dinner party. Mr. Gregory had a dinner party, and I took Mrs. Meller, and we met them. But the night of the assassination, or the day after, on November 23rd, the FBI had a report in the back of the volumes of George Bowie, and they said, uh, how did you know Lee Oswald? And George Bowie told the FBI, I met him through his wife. I was at her apartment, and I met him through his wife. So I would cross-file this under discrepancies. It had a meaning to me, because these men, these wealthy people in the community were alone with Marina. And Marina was creating the motive for the Warren Commission. You know, we, we talked in the very first show about Marina Oswald, that she's Everything has been quiet now, and these are the things I'm putting into a book, but because they affect our life, 
I have to go into those. Then I did the opinion of their marriage. Now I'll run down, when I'm reading these classifications for the people, Phil, what I'm doing is, if I say a book, I've got 300 pages on it, cross-filed. These aren't just titles, see. The opinion of their marriage, the love of the Russian language, because every person used the excuse that we housed Marina, like Mrs. Payne said, Marina lived with me because I wanted to learn the Russian language. Michael Payne had a security clearance. He was a designer for helicopters at Bell Aerospace. The vice president of Bell Aerospace was Mr. Dornberger, a Nazi scientist that came over with von Braun. These people are heavy in security clearances. Supposedly, Lee Oswald was getting all his communist literature at their house. But it all arrived after he was dead. I went into subscriptions. I went into magazines. The post office gets a daily worker in his box after he's dead, but nobody noticed it when he was living. You see, all of, so I go into the love of Russian language as an excuse for meeting, and what there was good about Lee Oswald. Now, I could go, Phil, time is running out, and I have uh, 70 books on Lee the Agent, which is 28,000 pages. But I think the people listening today will see, I took the Warren Report, read that, what, uh, and went into the background of these people, assuming they're telling me the truth, and came out with a pattern so horrendous that after reading it for two years, the material, then I devised a cross-filing system which took another five years to show who was saying these remarks. And the important significance historically, Phil, is that a man like Louis Neiser can be used, put his reputation on the line, and not one word that he said was true. And that is a crime in this country because we depend upon these people for some wisdom. <laughs> now, where do, you, where do you go with these facts? And uh, one of the things I think has to be stressed is that you're not fabricating these things, that what your work is doing, and, and stop me if I'm wrong, but what your work is doing and what your research is doing is is compiling, checking, counter-checking, comparing um, all the various facts which have been used to draw conclusions, which in many cases you've shown to be false. That's right. If, if we say that Oswald, if we need a motive for the commission, we say Oswald doesn't have a job, let's read what Riley Coffey says or Jaggers, Chili, or all these various things, and let's say he couldn't hold the job. But if I find, like he says, he was resented, he, he felt rejected, Lee Oswald wanted to go in the service when he was 16 years old. His brothers, both of them, were in the service. They turned him down because he was too young. By the time he was 17, he had memorized the entire Marine manual, and when he went in, he went right off to specialized training. This is a fact that the documents and the decrees are there. Now, when Lee Oswald, when you say he was rejected from this or that, he was skilled in language skills, microdotting, uh, he had the equipment of an agent in his garage. We talked about the electronic devices and uh, pedometers and all these different things. Uh, you, I've taken the facts. I read the report saying, okay, these people wanted to be nice to them. But when you say a man is a killer and you don't know him, you're not really being very nice to him. And you have to then go back, why would they say these things? Who are they connected with? What is their purpose? Uh, you could spend probably two shows on the next question, but uh, you seem to, in just the show today, you seem to have, have uh, established that for some reason Marina Oswald is telling a different story than what the facts would would uh, support as far as conclusions go. And, and can you really say why, well, why uh, she's doing this or why it appears that she's doing this? Well, uh, yes, we could do a show. I think... One reason, I don't, you know, uh, uh, she came from a wealthy family originally. Her background, she's not peasant stock. They were pushed aside by the communist takeover. She, her grandmama taught her French and told her she was a lady, and now she was living a hard life in the Soviet Union. Uh, Lee Oswald wrote a letter, which we talked on another program, dated February the 9th. It's in volume 16, page 33. He wrote a letter to the embassy in Washington, uh, Soviet embassy. He said, Agent Hostie, the FBI, has been to see my wife and offered her protection. And he put protection in quotes. And he had said that she could uh, stay in this country, that, that the visa he would arrange for her to, in effect, have citizenship in this country. And 
Lee concluded, I don't trust the notorious FBI. Well, three weeks later, he was dead. And I went into every State Department paper that is published by the Warren Commission thing, and Marina Oswald came over here with not one signature on a paper. You try to go to the Soviet Union and come back and not be seen. Now, in, I went into the State Department testimony because uh, John McVicker and Richard Snyder were the only two people in the Soviet Union that worked with Lee and Marina Oswald. Richard Snyder worked with Lee Oswald, and John McVicker worked with Marina to get her over to this country after she was married to him. And their testimony is a discrepancy. Those two men testified separately, and these, and they both, one said one thing and one said the other. Right off the bat, they were not, there was no cross-examination, and nobody challenged what they were saying in the beginning. But when I received that same book, Who's Who in the CIA, who described the historian of the war report, if you turn to page 353, and I had finished my research when I got this book, John McVicker in the Soviet Embassy, the CIA, and Richard Snyder was CIA, and they handled Lee and Marina's papers back and forth to the United States. Now, what Oswald was worried about uh, was something that the notorious FBI would be pulling. And her visa to return back to the Soviet Union, uh, she filled out a form for so many years. It wasn't a lifetime thing that she came in on with him on. And I have to take my evidence and make a broad guess. I, I don't know what people would do for citizenship in the United States. I know what Svetlana Stalin did, and the same people brought her and worked with her. I followed it very closely to work with Marina Oswald. Now, Svetlana makes very few common speeches on the air, but she talks about chaos in this country and anarchy. And I'm watching these people as the excuse for the fascism to tighten. I'm watching who says it or what. I relate all these people, the same lawyers, the same writers, work with Marina, the work with his other team. I followed it. I do my other work, the the dot volume, 26 volumes. I cross file, and I did everything else simultaneously. I do it every day. Since we've been talking about the research that you're doing, and and it's it's obviously very hard for a person listening on the radio to be able to get everything down here or to be able to check and and verify everything you're saying. But uh, I've I've seen that you do have a, a bibliography of some of the material, some of the books that you're using. And can people write for that yes, and get I, a copy of I it? I got or? a letter this week and uh, somebody asked for a bibliography and I'll mail it out. And you may say, like, there's 109 books on the assassination. You may say, well, which ones say Oswald did it and which ones didn't and how do you believe it? And I think that you should stick with the books where an author makes a statement and then he has a footnote, volume number and page number, and you look it up. Mark Lane, Rush to Judgment, Sylvia Mayer's Accessory After the Fact. Those are excellent books, and they have a volume number and a page number. And you can go to your library and you're not brainwashed. There's some books put out by the government that are completely not a basis, in fact, not one sentence. And you say, well, how do you judge? Well, go to the author. This is why it took me seven years to do my research, and I have not finished one book. I could have had one out four years ago. Is that I wanted a volume number and page number to back everything I said. And if you go into my filing cabinet of 200 books or these 28,000 pages, every single page, has a volume number and a page number. I don't have to say something, and then you say, Phil, where did you see that? And then I say, oh, I read it in the Warren Report. Or in volume 23, Marina said this. I can say in volume 16 on page 33, this letter is here. Or Lee Oswald's diary has the name of this woman in this volume on this page. So that historically, nobody has to go back and look it up. It's there, and you can't take it away. So I guess next week we'll get into more of the discrepancies and... Well, if people would like to go into how we research or cross-file, I'll continue. If they want, they can call the station I like it or send a card to you. What's your address? Uh, box 3904, Carmel, California, 93921. And then just put... Uh, put a card to go into research, and I'll continue with my cross-filing system. We only went into six subjects, but you can see how my mind worked to, to try to find out what was happening you know, when you're creating a personality in the first part that doesn't exist with the facts and back, you go to the witnesses and how many times they saw them, who they saw, who saw him beat her, who housed them, so that I have one book called Assignment to Take Marina. Who placed her in these homes? Who called and said, you take her this week, you take her this week? How 
she got her housing. And once you break this down, the way I did and took this time, you can go into the intelligence operation and see how other patsies in this country are created for political repressions that will get tighter if we don't stop it. See, my work on the one is so accurate that I never knew there was a Jim Garrison or a Clay Shaw. I wasn't working in the New Orleans area. But when the headline said that a Jim Garrison in New Orleans had arrested a Clay Shaw, I picked up the phone, made a long-distance call, asked to speak to Jim Garrison. He's busy with news conferences. I spoke to Alcock in the office or another gentleman. I have his name. I keep a record of the calls. I may Russell in California. I'm a researcher. I've done this many years' work. I suggest that you go to the Raleigh Coffee Company because that's the conduit of Oswald's Fund in the New Orleans area. Well, the next day, I'm sitting in my family room on the news broadcast, and a Marcella who worked with Oswald at Raleigh was brought in for questioning by Jim Garrison, and he's working at Boeing Aircraft. I, my work is so accurate, and it did turn out to be right, that I turned to my section called Jobs, and what was happening, in, see, the, real, the landlady at the apartment, when they had, interview her as a witness, and they say, what's going on? Where did Oswald work? And she says, well, I don't know where, that he worked at all that day because he was home all day, and he'd leave at night. And I'd see him, you know, on the porch or with the wife, you know, and the baby, and he'd work at night. Well, then he has to get a paycheck from Riley for something he isn't doing because he, he may show up there two or three days. They gave him an oil can and told him to start this top floor and go all the way down. And this is in the desert. What did he do at Riley? So you go into who got him the job at Riley, what was his position there, and the landlady is saying a lot of days he wasn't even there. So you have to know that he's being paid for something he wasn't doing, and that's why I called Jim in New Orleans. <laughs> when you go into what these people are saying and you put it on a column called jobs, you can look it up. And this is why the people in Washington you know, cannot take away now what we are saying to the people. Until next week when we go into it all again, thank you, Mae Brussel. You've been listening to Dialogue Assassination. Listening to Dialogue. Dialogue is a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News.